Awesome. Um, so um, I'm going to skip the introduction. Uh, thank you a lot for the fantastic work. Um, so what I'm going to talk in this session is uh, the recent work we made in Python 3.10 and uh, now in Python 3.11 about improving the error messages uh, in the interpreter. Uh, but I want to start first with an interesting story that also kind of mixes uh, what I was doing before doing uh, software engineering. So before, before my current role right now, I work at Bloomberg in the Python infrastructure team, so I basically make sure that you know, Python works at the company and whatnot. But before that, uh, I was uh, doing my PhD um, in uh, theoretical physics, right? And in the PhD, normally you do like pen and paper, although these days it's more like you know, computer and, and pen and paper. Um, but interestingly, I started to use Python at the time. And uh, there is this nice story that I always like to think about when people ask me, like, oh, what do you think, you know, is the most uh, interesting improvement you can do to the language? And so figure this thing, right? Like, we were in the room, like, three, three of us doing uh, our PhD, right? So the three of, the, of them PhD candidates, quite smart people. And one of my friends uh, was, uh, was starting to call in Python, and he was doing some, some kind of a script to, you know, like, munch data or whatever. The important thing here is that there was something that was not working. Particularly, uh, my friend had a syntax error, but the problem is that he couldn't figure out what was the problem with the syntax error, like why that was wrong, right? And my friend then says, oh, Pablo, like, can you come here and, and try to help me? And I tried, and then we were looking at the script, and we couldn't figure out what was wrong. We started like, changing things randomly, as you do when you're a professional software engineer, until something happens. And we even bring a third PhD student. Okay, figure out the scene, right? Like three PhD students, we could figure out the deepest mysteries of the universe, but we couldn't fix a syntax error. Um, so not good, right? And uh, I will show you what was the syntax error, so you can see, like, because you may be thinking, <laughs> PhD students, they cannot solve syntax errors. Um, so the syntax error was this one. Who knows what's wrong with that? It's not in the, the indentation is good. Obviously, the, the error is not in exactly in this line, but this is the error that you get. Um, so the, the line is fantastic. Like, don't, don't lose your time trying to figure out what is wrong with that. The line is correctly. Um, so I'm going to give you more context. This is the code that more or less is around that line. Can, can, who, who sees the, the, the error? OK. OK, nice. Exactly. So the error is that uh, if you look at the fancy dictionary there, this, um, like there is one open bracket, there is two open bracket, oh, there is only one closed bracket. But look at the error. No bueno. So, so, so this is very annoying. And what I'm showing you here is like the, the, the smaller example I can show you so it fits on the slide. But obviously, as you can imagine, the original code has a gigantic dictionary full of scientific whatever. Uh, and instead of two curly braces, there's like 16 of them. And the one that is not close is like super deep into the dictionary. So it was not that easy to find, right? But the problem is that like three million years, uh, af like years after the close bracket, you find the function definition and the error happens on the function definition, right? You may be thinking, wow, Python is quite bad, huh? Well, it may, it may be true, or especially before 310, right? But like the, the thing here is that for the parser point of view, it makes sense because like it's trying to understand the dictionary and it's saying, okay, yeah, dictionary, I can see here things that I recognize in dictionaries and whatnot. And then, you know, it, it's trying to find that close bracket, but it's not finding it. So when it reaches the function definition, it thinks it's still inside the dictionary. And then it says, yeah, you cannot do this function definition inside the dictionary. What are you thinking about? Uh, but but like you as a human have other plans, right? Like you, you're planning to do this fancy function definition and then the thing is getting in the way. And this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Like you as a human have some ideas of how the world works and the parser has other ideas. Normally the parser is smarter. Um, it's just that, you know, when it complains, it's not very, it's not very useful. So this is what we're trying to solve, right? And not this particular example in particular, but all, all of them, right? So I want to show you like some other problems that, that Python has. Um, so for instance, this is just the problem that you saw. If you don't close a bracket in a dictionary definition or, or some other collection, and then you have something else, in this case a function definition, then you get this ugly invalid syntax. So this is another one. Um, if, you, if you try to define uh, like a comprehension, uh, but then you use uh, a comma and unparenthesized tuple in the value, and then you get syntax error. This syntax error is quite weird. You have not seen it before. It's because you need to parenthesize the tuple in the value. 
Uh, this is, if you don't close uh, like, a, like a list and then you have something else like an equality, then you get the, <laughs> you get the syntax errors on the equal. Um, quite weird. Uh, think about that these are simplified examples, right? Like, like these, these things can be like super complicated in the, at the beginning and then you get the error like, you know, super far away. So not good. Uh, for instance, this is quite funny. Uh, you get a bunch of dictionary, uh, dictionary matching uh, core developer names to their GitHub usernames, uh, and you see you, you, you forget a comma over there, and then what this is going to tell you is that uh, Gukas Langa is a syntax error, which is kind of rude, um, but you know, like, no bueno. Um, so this is another funny one. Uh, if you see this one, you may be like, especially again, think about when these co dictionaries are quite complicated. Um, th th this is this can be quite difficult to the back. Um, I mean, it won't tell. It won't take more than five or ten minutes. But these five or ten minutes that you will, you know, have to spend doing this thing instead of what you want to do for real. Uh, this is another one. If you don't parenthesize uh, like exception in, in exception uh, multiple exception handlers, you get a syntax error in the comma. Um, or this one, when you forget, uh, like, a, for whatever reason, you, you forget the value in a dictionary, that you get a syntax error on the bracket. <laughs> and uh, everyone's favorite, this one. How, how, how many times have you found this one? And actually, the question is, how many times have you had to explain to someone what this means? Well, I expected more, more hands. So do, you know, do you know, who knows what this means, actually? Oh, wow, okay, and, uh, there is some explaining here. So EOF stands for end of file, because apparently writing you know, the, whole, uh, the whole sentence is expensive, so we, we put EOF. Um, the reason you don't see anything is because the syntax error is pointing at the end of the file, and at the end of the file there is nothing, so that's what the, you know, there is no code there. Um, and if you see the file example.py, has, in, in reality, has nine lines. And it's telling you that the error is on line 10 because it's the end of the file. But, but this is, everything is wrong with this slide. Like, the, the, the lines are wrong. Like, if you try to use your editor to go to line 10, there is no line 10. Like, what the fuck is EOF? <laughs> and, like, you know, like, wh what is this caret? Like, what, what is the, like, do you see this thing, like, the, the caret pointing to the void? And it's like, you know, all your hopes are, are just lost. Like, what is this going on, right? Uh, you know, if you have seen this one or two times, you may say, okay, yeah, I got it. Like, I know what this means, like, I will fix it. But, like, think about, you know, some uh, young person, you know, full of life and uh, excitement, and it's like, I'm going to learn Python. And then Python says, I, I have a thing for you. And, you know, like, then, then you, you got all these people saying, oh, man, like, Python is quite hard. And it's not really hard, it's just that we have this, 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 this kind of errors, right? So, not good. So the idea that we, so, you know, apart from many other improvements we have made in the Python interpreter over the years, in Python 3.10, so the previous version, well, or the current version, because we are going to release 3.11 this year, we said, okay, we, we, we need to improve the situation, right? So let me show you some of the new improvements that we have, and then we are going to cover how we made them, and like different problems that um, you, may, you may find with those errors. So uh, all of these errors are possible because uh, the work that we did with Guido and Lisandro in PEF uh, 617, uh, and we basically replaced the whole parser. Um, the, the parser that was before, if you check the, the commits, so the, the first parser that we have, it was an L1 parser, which is a kind of parser, it's not important what is the difference, but if you see the dates uh, over there, the first parser was basically committed in uh, 1919, and the pair parser was committed on 2020, so it's almost 30 year old, like it's the, the, the previous parser was there for 30 years. It's probably, or it was probably one of the oldest pieces of Python which means that you know, it, it was working quite nicely because you could write Python before, right? Um, but you know, it had all these different problems and actually it was like, like it, it was not allowing us to do some of the cool stuff that you can see on Python 3.10 and forwards. For instance, just because we have a new parser, we could do a bunch of things like parenthesize context managers. Uh, so you can write like parentheses around context manager groups. Or for instance, you can have match statements, like who likes match statements? Uh, well, a bunch of people, nice, good, good. Um, you need to you need to say that thing more on the internet so people don't only think that they they suck. Um, everybody likes my statements, right? So so these these things are only possible with the new parser. But there is a problem, right? Because like you know the, the new parser allows all these things, and you know we are introducing all these funky grammar, like you know match statements. What is even that? Uh, and people get angry in the internet, right? Like that's because that's that's what you do in the internet. You just go and like you get angry, and, and someone gives you money or something. Um, but then you know that is not good, and people demonize the the back parser because it's like, 
or a stupid tool is allowing humans to do things. And, and, and they think that the tool is bad, right? An evil tool. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm going to try to show you here is that, you know, the back parser is, is not bad, right? It's like, like a knife. Like, it's not inherently bad. I mean, you can do bad things with a knife, but I don't know. You can also do bad things with a spoon, and people don't hate the spoons. Um, so, <laughs> well, don't quote me on that. But, like, uh, anyway, the idea is that I want to show you that you can do a bunch of very cool things with this parser that is not only funky syntax um, that you may or may not like. Uh, in particular, I want you to think of the perk parser as allowing a bunch of super cool uh, user centric features like error messages, but other things that uh, we may be able to cover in the questions, like, you know, improve F strings and whatnot. Okay, so let me show you a bunch of the cool things that we can do with the peg parser. So for instance, if this is a very common error. If you have like, um, like a conditional and then you have a, a, you forget the, the column, which a lot of people do, instead of uh, we are like, you know, invalid syntax, then you get like, oh, haha, <laughs> expected column over there. Nice. Uh, then imagine that, again, you forget like the value in a dictionary, right? Like that set over there doesn't have a value. Now the parser tells you, whoop, I was expecting an expression after the key and the column, which is nice. Uh, imagine that this is also very common. Uh, you get a, a conditional, and instead of like when you want to compare two things, instead of comparing them, you use one equal. Um, because, you know, it happens to everyone, even to the best of us. And instead of, like, giving you a, fun a funky, like, you know, invalid syntax, who knows where, then you get, like, this nice error saying, like, oh, I cannot a assign to an attribute here. Maybe you meant to use, like, double equals or the walrus. Uh, and here again, like, maybe you forget a comma in a dictionary, um, like, uh, a literal, and now the parcel is telling you, whoop, and that doesn't look good. Like, oh, maybe you're forgetting a comma over there, which is very useful. It doesn't report you, like, three million light years away. Um, so everybody wins. Uh, for instance, here, this one, like, oh, you misindented that uh, if, right? Like, mm, bad day. No, uh, because now with the parser, will tell you, oh, you, you misindented that uh, if statement on line two, so you can just go and fix it. Um, and everyone's favorite. Uh, so if you go back in time, those PhD students now will be very happy because now it tells you that the dictionary was not close. Oh, wow, what about that? Huh? Uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four years of PhD just thrown away when I could have this. Um, don't do PhDs. Anyway, uh, awesome, right? This is just a bunch of them. I'm not going to cover all of them because like, we will be here forever. Um, but I want you to teach you about uh, how I think this error message is maybe hard. So, so the, the idea here is that there is two components of these things, right? Like there is a technical component, which I'm going to more or less cover, but I want you to think about these things also as the human component versus the machine component. Because as a human, you know what you want to do, right? Okay, I want to write a dictionary. But, but the, the machine, like the person in particular, is going to try to understand what you are trying to write. And assuming that you make an error, or you make a mistake, then the person is going to try to understand what you may be trying to do. And you know, you know what you are trying to do, but like the machine may not be able to. And the, the complexity on all of these things is that the guess that the parser is going to do is not very far away from what you are really trying to do, right? And that is quite hard. Like if, if, you know, it's not only on parsers. Every time you try to do errors on your applications, right? Like maybe you're checking if a value is less than uh, you know bigger than zero or something, and then it turns out that you need to for giving a good error message, you need to figure out why someone will have passed you a number bigger than zero, oh, sorry, less than zero. Maybe they are trying to index a list from the back. Okay, maybe, you know, you don't allow that and then you need to emit an error message. So, you know, bringing the technicalities of things and what humans expect is quite a hard task. That is one of them, but we are going to focus on the technical challenges, which are more funnier. Uh, okay, so as an example of why adding error messages is difficult. Think about this, right? Let, let's imagine that you want to introduce these error messages, right? Like you have a list, and if someone forgets a comma between two of the elements, then you want to say, oh, perhaps you forgot a comma. So let's try to implement this together, right? Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you go to the grammar of the language, and now it's a pet grammar. You don't need to understand what this means, but like uh, I will more or less uh, give you the idea. So you, need, you introduce a new rule. We are going to call this rule invalid expression, and then you say that an invalid expression is an expression, like three plus two, or a, or I don't know, dictionary, 
uh, followed by another expression without a comma in the middle, right? So think about x and then y, or 1 plus 1 and then 3 plus 2, or something like that, right? So if there is not a comma between two expressions, then it's very likely that someone forgot that comma, right? And then we capture the, these two expressions using this uh, equal syntax, and then if that happens, like if this rule parses, like if the parser sees that this is happening, then we are going to raise a syntax error, and then we are going to say, we are going to point to A and B, and then we are going to say, oh, invalid syntax, perhaps you forgot a comma. So what we expect, sorry, what we expect is precisely that, right? Okay, so you implement this rule, makes all the sense in the world, and what happens? Well, it turns out that the rule doesn't work. It doesn't work because, for instance, if you forget the in keyword in a for loop, then you get, oh, perhaps you forgot a comma. No bueno. Uh, then it turns out that if you write an incorrect string prefix, then you also get invalid, maybe you forgot a comma, which obviously is not the problem. Um, but you also, like if you forgot to uh, close a, um, you know, a, a tuple, for instance, and then you have an equality afterwards, you also get perhaps you forgot a comma, which is obviously wrong. Uh, and then you get this. Um, I don't know what is wrong with this, but apparently I'm forgetting a comma. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also, like, you know, oh, uh, you, you write a bunch of numbers, because, like, why not? And you're getting the comma, apparently, on the, on the, on the, on the right part of the expression for some reason. Uh, not, why, not good. Uh, and also, like, match statements don't work anymore, because, you know, there are two names together, except that one of them may be or may not be a keyword, because I don't know if you know it, but match is not a keyword, it's a soft keyword. Ooh, um, so it doesn't work, right? Oh, damn, uh, soft keywords don't work anymore. So, you know, like, not good. And you may be thinking, oh, yeah, but this is all theoretical, right? It's not that someone has actually had to fix all these problems when they introduce the comma error. Uh, as you can see, this is a real issue that I fix uh, when I introduce the comma error. So what you have seen is me actually uh, learning that error messages are hard. Um, yeah, not good. And this is just four of them. There was like six or seven. So, you know, it's quite hard because, like, you, you may be thinking about a super small, like, subset of the problem, you know, expression plus expression, like, why that will appear in any other case? And it turns out that, you know, you forgot about all these cases, right? And that's the problem because you may be very happy and thinking that, oh, I got it, I understand what the problem is, but when you put that uh, pattern that you're trying to match everywhere, you're forgetting that, you know, all these other cases can also be matching your rule. It's like writing a regular expression, right? Like, you write a regular expression, and the regular expression is too generic, and it's matching things that you don't want to match. So it's the same idea, but with a lot more people complaining about it. Um, so yeah, that is quite hard. Uh, there is other problems. In particular, um, the peg parser turns that uh, peg parsers are, by nature, exponential. This means that the bigger your input is, the more time they take to parse by default. Um, and the, the complexity of, that they grow in time is exponential. This means that the more characters you add, it grows in exponential time. Normally, you fix this problem by introducing what is called a memoization cache. So that way, you take them and tame them to be linear. That is called pack rat parsing. Uh, it's a very common technique, and this is partially what we do in Python, but you need, to, you need to put that thing in. Like, you need to say, I want to use the cache here. Otherwise, you will be using memory all over the place but you can think that you have all of the cases covered, but you may uh, forgetting about some of them. For instance, it turns out that in Python 3.10, this is fixed, but it used this, this, this expression, which is a syntax error, because you know it's a bunch of open brackets and a column, but you cannot write that. Uh, Python takes two seconds to tell you that this is a syntax error. You may be thinking, well, I have two seconds, but like this expression takes over an hour. Well, it's fixed, right? Like, you know, we fix it, like, you know, here's the issue, and like, apparently, someone here was very happy, because, uh, I don't know, they like to put a lot of brackets, and now they, they can have, like, syntax errors in nanoseconds, so, uh, hooray. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard, because, like, you may be thinking that you have everything, and then someone, like, you know, the bracket guy comes in and says, hey, what about my brackets? And, like, you know, like, they take over an hour, and, and people are not happy. So, you know, you, you need, there is a lot of things. What I want to teach you here with this is that there is a lot of things to take into account when you add a syntax error, not only on <clears throat> will this match rules that I don't have in mind, but also on the very core technicalities of the parser. In this case, it turns out that the very technical details of how the parser works, you know, a packer parser and like uh, exponential time, et cetera, et cetera, can percolate over, you know, GitHub issues or whatever. So those are hard. Um, but we have, it turns out that now that we have like a lot of syntax error cover, we say, oh, why, why is stopping here, right? Like, why is stopping only on syntax errors when we can do also runtime suggestions? And this is very interesting as well. 
because runtime suggestions are a different beast, uh, right? Like parser errors happen when, when the parser tries to understand your program, right? And that happens only once. Normally the, the Python compiler then produces PYC files and those PYC files are compiled by code. So the second time you run your programs or your modules, they don't need to be parsed again. They just load those PYC files from memory and everyone is happy. So runtime suggestions are different. These are errors that are detected and generated at runtime, which means that you are paying for the detection and the and producing the error. And I have to say something over here because like when, when you're going to see these errors, a lot of people say, oh, this is just like Rust. I mean, sure, yeah, Rust is cool and has a lot of error messages, but like, come on, like we, we, we don't go copying other languages. Like we can also do like independent work, right? Like we, we can all be nice programmers and languages, right? Without having to say, oh, you are just copying Rust. Um, in particular, runtime suggestions is something that Rust normally doesn't, or other languages, doesn't need to care about a lot. Because normally, these nice error messages that you get with the Rust compiler happen at compile time, which means that, you know, it's not when your program runs. These errors have the extra complexity that we need to make sure that your application is not slower when it runs just because we want to produce better error messages. Let me show you some of the ones that we pack in Python 3.10. So for instance, uh, if you mistype, uh, when you are trying to access an uh, attribute in a, in a module, for instance, collection, I wrote name tuple, uh, which is wrong, instead of telling you like, okay, yeah, we don't have name tuples here, uh, now we say, oh, maybe you mean uh, name tuple, right? Okay, yeah, nice, uh, I like that. Um, and this also happens with like variables. For instance, if you try to write a spatial black hole, which it, I never get it right, uh, then uh, and you have a variable w correctly uh, written, and then you mistype it in a variable. Then instead of telling you, yeah, this variable doesn't exist, um, at the end it tells you, oh, maybe you meant like you know the correct uh, spelling of that. Nice. Uh, so how how we do that? Well, this has a problem, right? Because like the problem is that if uh, well, let, let me show you how we do that, and you will understand what the problem is. So for instance, this is the idea. The first thing we did is that um, when you when you have a, an attribute error, so for instance, in this case, I'm trying to access the attribute something on the uh, variable x, which doesn't have something. Uh, then we have in Python 3.10, we have placed two more special attributes on the attribute error. We have placed the name that you're trying to access and the object. These two were not available before. And therefore, the exception itself, the attribute error, knows the name that you are trying to access inside the attribute error and what object you were trying to do. So for instance, you print name and object, the name uh, of the attribute is something here, and the object is this x over here. OK, nice. The problem is that at this point you could say, oh, when we construct the attribute error, we can do this, this super fancy, you know, math scientist computation and trying to find what is the attribute that you may be trying to access. The problem is that this code is valid. Like someone may be doing, you know, a, an attribute access and then failing the attribute access and the program can keep running nicely. So if you do the computation at this stage, the program is going to be super slow because now you're paying for computing an error message that is never going to be shown. And that is the challenge. The challenge here is like, how do you do these nice errors only when nobody cares about, like when people will care about the error and the program won't continue. So the way we do that is that um, we, the, the algorithm that we are going to run is a word distance, so it's nothing fancy. This is, as you can see, like if it's in a, in a slide, you don't need to understand what's going on. This is called a Levenstein distance. The actual algorithm that we use in Python is not Levenstein distance, it's a modified version uh, inspired by GCC and other uh, compilers that have thought about this much more than us. Uh, but the idea is that you basically have a bunch of words, which are the attributes that are in the object, then you have the attribute that you are trying to access, and then you find which is the one that is more similar based on something called uh, a string distance. So you can search this in Wikipedia. It's not important for this. It's just that this computation may be quite heavy. Um, so what we do here, this is the basic algorithm. Then we say, okay, we initialize the current distance to minus one, and then we use the dir function over the object just to give us all the real attributes that is there. Then we try all possible uh, attributes. We calculate the word instance. We take the smaller one, and then we return that as the suggestion. So this is the idea. Obviously, this is made in C. The code is insane, uh, but you know, in Python, it seems that it's even reasonable. Uh, but this is the idea, right? And the, the thing is that, you know, like the problem is that that thing needs to be faster still. Like if someone is trying to access an attribute, uh, raising the attribute error and then doing something that is legit and the program continues cannot, cannot, be, fa cannot be slow. Uh, not only cannot be slow, but it cannot be even a bit slower because like people will care a lot. I mean, I don't know if this is a pattern that people do a lot, but like they could perfectly do it and you know, like you need to care about what's going on there. 
So the way we do that is that uh, this is C code, so don't freak out. It is, it's very small, so you don't need to read it. But the idea is that there is this uh, function inside the interpreter called print exception in C, right? And this is executed when the exception has reached the top level, nobody has catched that exception, and we're just going to print it. This is the traceback that you normally see. So at that stage, the interpreter is no more. The party has closed. You know, everyone is going home, and then we are printing the exception. So at that point, we can take a bit more time to, you know, calculate stuff. So if you see this, this C code, I have commented out a bunch of things, but what it does is it gets the exception, then it prints the exception file and line, so it's telling you where the exception is happening, then it's printing the exception message, it's a bunch of things, and then we are adding this extra thing called print exception suggestions. And print exception suggestions, you know, like, uh, which is that line over there, uh, so, well, so this, this, this is basically the code that I showed you, except that it's like a lot of C code that I'm not going to show, but the, the main idea is that the way we try to make sure that your programs are not as slow is that this only runs when the exceptions are being printed, nobody has catch them, the interpreter is going down, so at that st stage we can take a bit more time doing this computation. We also have like a lot of uh, extra checks, like for instance if you have an object that has six million attributes, we only take like a bunch of them. Also like if the strings are very big, we don't compare super big strings because that would take like a lot of time. So there is a, a bunch of extra things that we take into account, uh, so this doesn't take like forever. But the idea is that, that I want to show you is that even if these improvements are quite, uh, quite cool, um, you need to be very careful so they don't impact like everyone, right? Cool. So the last thing that I want to show you here is like better traceback on Python 3.11, which is something that I worked together uh, with Amara and Batuhan. Batuhan is over there, so you can thank him also after the talk. And, um, and this is super cool. This is going to land, well, this lands already on 3.11, and we want to show you like what this means. So imagine I have you, you, this traceback, right? In this traceback, you can see that you, you, know, you have a bunch of mathematical computation, like you are subtracting two points, and then you're adding something else, and the error is, oh no, non-type object has no attribute x. So this means that one of these guys over here is none, but which one is it? Oh, you don't know. But with the new and improved, uh, um, you know, granular messages, then you get this nice underline telling you that guy is none. So you don't need to attach a debugger. You can just see it from the traceback. How cool is that? It's cool. <laughs> awesome. But wait, wait, it gets better. Like, what about this other error? Oh, no, I have this gigantic JSON, right? And I have, like, many levels of the JSON, like A, B, C, D, R. Ah. And then I get this horrible error saying non type object is not subscriptable. Which one is none? Oh, is this one? Oh, nice! You don't need to touch the buggers. Now you can see it. It's there. Uh, awesome. And it works with everything. Like it works with your libraries. It works with your code. It works with absolutely anything. Do you have this weird, like you know, super mathematical computation? Division by zero. Which one is zero? Is that one? So it's awesome. You can just see it there. It's very cool. Um, so how we do this? So the, the way we do this is that, uh, you know, when you write this code, the Python interpreter writes a bunch of uh, bytecode instructions. And those bytecode instructions basically things like, okay, load this name and access this subscript on the name and a bunch of things. So what we do here is that we attach positions from the code to every of these bytecode instructions. So we know which, ca which chunk of the code generates every of these bytecode instructions. Uh, you can access this thing in 3.11, for instance, using in the this module, you have this function called get instructions, and it will print you a bunch of instructions, uh, objects, and you can see that, for instance, for this binary subscript, which is basically the square brackets, uh, you can have this new attribute called positions, and positions tells you, like, the line number and the end line number, because, you know, you can write the uh, open square bracket in one line and the closed square bracket in another, and it will tell you the column offset and the end column offset. So you can know exactly which bunch of the code associates with the bytecode instruction. And then when the exception raises, we have this ridiculous amount of code. This is very ridiculous. You don't need to look at it. Uh, but this takes into account, like, you know, this extracts the, the chunk of the code that is raising the exception. We reparse that code to be able to see, oh, actually this looks like a uh, you know, a, a subscript or a binary operation or something that we can also add extra information. Um, well, but Tuhan worked very hard to make this right, uh, and, and it's very good code, but it's C code, so everybody hates it. We have even, like, a, a nice comment over there. You can see, like, the structure, so, you know, like, someone could make their PhD on this. Um, but the idea is that, you know, uh, we put a lot of hard uh, work, so, you know, you get all these nice squibbles, and we will tell you exactly what's going on. And the way we do this then is basically, you know, uh, we have this, this chunk of code, then we produce like the positions, and we know that every bytecode instruction, uh, you know, what positions they have, 
Uh, once we know the, 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 by the instruction that has raised an error, so for instance, imagine that accessing a subscript because it's known there is not there, so this instruction raises an error, then we reparse and we can use the AST of the expression and the positions to rematch and understand, oh, actually what, what is failing is a subscript and this is the subscript and the one that is failing is the last on the, on the right. And we using that, we can actually point exactly where the, um, where the expression is failing exactly. So we can also add this extra contextual uh, different, different kind of squiggles pointing to it. Very cool, uh, soon on 3.11. Awesome, so last thing, so how can you help? And I think, yeah, so, so as you can see, this is quite cool because like, uh, you know, this takes a lot of work, but it turns out that a lot of people are very, very excited about this. Uh, like uh, I get a lot of people like coming and saying, oh man, like, I, I love this new error messages. And interestingly, what I found is that, uh, you know, we, we have been working very hard on many other parts of the interpreter, like, you know, making Python faster or new modules or new APIs or like fixing old bugs. But like by far, the thing that got most people excited in my experience is this. So we are trying to, I can tell you that we are trying to put more effort on making sure that, you know, the interpreter gets smarter telling you errors. Um, and uh, hopefully in 3.12 you get even more improvements. But it will be good if you give us a hand, right? So how can you give us a hand? Cool. So the first thing that you can do if you want to get your hands dirty is that you may be able to say, okay, I want to add a bunch of new syntax errors. So I wrote this, this big, big document in the Python developer's guide. So it's uh, devguide.python.org uh, or something like that. If you search in Google devguide Python, it will, you will find it. And here you have this, this nice document called uh, Guide to see Python Parser. And you know, this is a very technical document, so if this, if this is not your cup of tea, you don't need to go through it. But this will go through like how the parser works and like how you add new grammar and a bunch of things like, you know, also if you're doing these talks that there is one every PyCon when someone modifies the language to add like pipe operators or new lambdas or whatever, I have seen all of them. I have even do one myself, obviously. Uh, so, so, you know, you can also read this and you will find how the new parser works so you can implement very funky new grammar. Um, but uh, you can actually read it, and at the end, you will find a section on how we add new error messages. And that will explain you like all the problems that you may have, like how you can test new error messages, how to make sure that your error messages are good, uh, et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, actually, a lot of people have done that. And for instance, in Python 3.11, we have, this is just a bunch of them, but there is more. We have a bunch of people just coming in and saying, oh, uh, I'm finding you know, this, this problem uh, a lot, and this error message is not good. So they are actually suggesting, or even uh, you know, doing themselves like uh, pull requests against the Python, adding uh, new error messages so you know they, they improve. I have to say something here. This sounds very exciting and you may have like a, a, an error that you really, really, really hate and then you spend like you know 10 million hours trying to fix the grammar just so it raises a nice error and unfortunately we need to reject your PR. The reason is that even if you know we understand that it takes a lot of time and it's not easy and then you're very excited, uh, it may have side effects or it may be making the parser uh, slower. As you can see, as you saw before, there is a bunch of things to consider, right? And you can have like weird surprises that you're not maybe very aware of. So if you try to do this thing, we really, really want you to try and, and you know to help us. It's just that come with a clear mind and you know be open because we may need to unfortunately reject your suggestion or modify it or change it. Uh, just because these things are quite hard when you consider it in one of the, or not, or if not the most popular language in the world, right? There's a lot of users of the language, and if you get it wrong only once, you're going to have all of them at, at our doorstep with like tortures and pitchforks, and uh, and we are the ones that are going to get the pitchforks, right? Uh, not you. So just you know, we, we want you to. So this is not deterring you to do it. It's just that you know, come with a a bunch of them, put some some nice uh, candles, and then open the pull request. Um, but yeah, that, you can do that. But if you don't like to get your hands dirty or you don't like C code or you don't like parsers and grammars, something that you can do which is super useful as well is that, for instance, if you are a teacher or you use Python, um, you, you teach people Python or you interact with Python yourself a lot or something like that, and then you have errors that you have seen people struggle a lot or you struggle a lot yourself with some particular kind of errors, even if it's uh, syntax errors or other kind of errors, you can open issues on the Python backtracker, which now is on GitHub, so, you know, you go to the Python repo and issues, uh, and you can tell us, hey, I hate this error, can you help me? And then we will tell you like, yes, obviously. Sometimes we'll tell you no, but, um, but mostly we try to tell you yes. Uh, so that will be very useful, why? Because we as Python developers, 
uh, like developers of the language itself, we are quite biased towards like errors. Like some of the errors are super, super weird, but we have seen them so many times that we don't mind them anymore. Like we know what they mean, right? So like, why are we going to fix them? But maybe you don't, right? Or maybe your, your students don't. Or maybe like, I don't know, uh, you find something super, super particularly weird, right? So, so for us, it's very difficult to identify and prioritize these errors uh, to know which ones need to be fixed before, right? Uh, and with your help, we, can, we, we will be able to do it if you tell us like which ones are the worst. Um, actually, many, many people have done this, and one of the reasons we have prioritized these errors is because people told us um, you know, that they, they are worse. So that's, that's the whole talk. Uh, so the summary here is like, you know, peg parsers are cool. Error messages are cooler. Uh, 3.11 is going to be incredible if we manage to release it. <laughs> because like, uh, if you have followed the, um, the latest developments, it's getting a bit difficult to release, but we are getting there. Um, and as you can see, we have put a lot of, a lot of work to make sure that you know, your experience when dealing with errors, like when things don't, uh, don't work anymore, uh, is, is great. And I suppose that you know the moral of the story is that if you are doing your PhD and then you find a bunch of syntax errors that you cannot solve, um, you can cry in a corner. Alternative, you can you know um, study a lot of Python and parsers and grammars and become a core developer and then spend two years trying to uh, improve the parser, change the parser of one of the biggest languages in the world, and then fix the error. What about that? Or you can wait for someone to do it instead of you. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the talk and uh, that's it. Okay, uh, so we're a bit ahead of the schedule, uh, so we have time for plenty of questions. So I'd ask people in the room, if you have a question, to just line up in front of the microphone here. And for people online, just to let the online uh, organizer know that you have a question so that they can pop it up on the screen. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for the talk and for your work. I was just wondering if Python 3.12 will write itself. <laughs> well, no, but like, <laughs> but, but Python 3.10 is already writing itself in some ways. So for instance, uh, the, the, the parser that we have is, is called, uh, so, so the, you know, it's written in Xiang whatnot, but we don't write the parser actually. We, what we do is something that actually is only happening on research groups and things like that because in, in, the, in the wild you don't find this. But what we have is a parser generator. So we have a program that reads the grammar and then generates a C parser, right? But it turns out that that parser can also read itself and generate itself. So, so in some ways, Python is already you know, generating itself, which is quite cool. Uh, thanks for the question. Do we have any questions online? No, okay, go ahead. Again, thanks for the talk and the work, it's great. Nice. Um, I was wondering how you do um, regression testing or how do you judge the effects of a potential new error message because uh, to judge the effects of a potential change on correct Python code, there's a 10 million billion lines of correct Python code out there you can check, but do you have a corpus of incorrect Python code? Do you have like a, I imagine you have individual tests, but do you have a large body of statistically useful incorrect Python code you can work from? What well, an excellent question. So this is actually a very, very, very hard thing to, to solve. We, we have things. So the reason, just, just an introduction why the, this is a problem. So the, the reason this is a problem is because what is valid Python is a very concise, well, it's not a small, like technically it's an infinite amount of programs, like you can write infinite amount of valid Python programs, but there is much more constraints than what is not Python. What is not Python by definition is everything else. So, so it's very difficult to test like this other infinity, right? Like in cardinality is a left six million. So um, the, the problem is that we, to do that, um, what you need to test basically is like, okay, imagine that you have a syntax error that you want to add, right? And then you know exactly the kind of code that will fail there. So what you do is that you start mutating that string slightly to see if the syntax error still happens. And then you have a manual step when you find like the biggest errors at the beginning. So you start to trim it down. And then what you do after that is that you analyze the resulting grammar. This is what I do, right? And we have a small program that does this. So you analyze the resulting grammar to know, basically, to do a bit of grab analysis over what rules are going to be affected by the new one that you're adding. So you know exactly how the syntax error may propagate around. Uh, this, is, this is very 
insufficient in most cases because, again, the amount of invalid Python programs is, is gigantic. And unfortunately, we tried to find a corpus of invalid Python programs. Uh, there is several that we have found in research groups or in Stack Overflow, actually. They, they have collected all the um, questions in, in Stack Overflow that are about syntax errors. But the problem is that most of them are intention errors. So, uh, yeah, yeah, or like missing columns. So we already know, and those are quite easy to do, but like the, the comma one, that is very hard. And the problem is that to understand all the ways, like that slide when I showed you all the different problems, to understand all the ways this could go wrong and the suggestion may be incorrect, is quite hard. And the only way to do this thing is, is trying to do a, a, a bunch of graph analysis and trying to find around, because there is no way to do facets for this. Like because, because you cannot automatically check this suggestion make no sense, right? Um, so what we do is like a bunch of that and then waiting for users to report, oh, what a ridiculous suggestion, right? What we do as well is that the error doesn't say this is wrong. What we say is like, perhaps you forgot a comma, right? I mean, it's just perhaps, right? Like maybe, maybe it's not. So you cannot be super angry if you say, oh, this suggestion is wrong, right? Because we say, oh, perhaps. Um, so, you know, that, that, but, but thank you. It's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to check again if there are any questions online. No? Okay, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question. Um, uh, I, have, I have the feeling that in the past few years, couple of years, there has been more uh, focus on user experiments, user experience on uh, exceptions. Also, for example, uh, PIP having better exception messages, now uh, Python. Um, I think, uh, what, is, what is your thoughts on that, like on when that started to happen, or um, is it just because, for Python, is it just because of the new uh, uh, pack parser, or is there something, some other movement going on that focuses on this UX on uh, uh, exceptions? Right, I, I can absolutely tell you exactly what happened, because I, so the, the, what happened is that someone complained on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, Anthony Sotil, and he said like, it was the error with the, like the end of file, like, you know, you forgot to close the parenthesis thing. And he's like, oh, this is horrible. No, 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 no. And I said, like, damn, okay, let me fix this. And then, you know, I fix it and I show it to people and people were, wow, incredible. And I said, okay, let, let's do more of this. And it turns out that Pradium, uh, which is uh, the, the PIP maintainer that did the implementation on PIP, works on my team. And, you know, I was saying, like, oh, people like this thing. So he said, like, okay, let me try that to PIP. So as you can see, like, please don't complain on Twitter. That's not the way to solve problems. But, like, <laughs> As you can see, like a small spark followed by what I think is the most important part, a lot of the excitement from users telling us, we like this work, right? Like, you know, uh, the other work that you do is nice, but like this is very nice. Uh, so it, that's the feel of open source, right? Like we see our users excited about something and then we put a lot more effort, right? And then, you know, like very smart people like about 200 and Amar and other people join the effort and we start thinking about, okay, how can we do more and more and more? But yeah, you know, if you backtrace this thing to the beginning, it's just some people complain on Twitter. <laughs> awesome. Hey, thank you for the talk. So a uh, question about, um, so Python is still evolving and the, the syntax is evolving and, and new pep gets accepted and that changes the syntax of the language. So how does that affect the work you've been doing and uh, how changes in the language need to be maintained in, in right. terms of this? Right, very good question as well. So, so the, the, when, when we add new grammar in the language, like for instance, when we added the uh, exception groups or when we added the, um, the match statements, we normally work with, I mean, the authors are normally core developers in this case or, or a core developer is the implementer. So we work with them to make sure that the new grammar also have error paths. Like for instance, match statements have a bunch of them. Uh, normally the first implementation, because these implementations are quite big already, they have a minimal subset of them, so just a bunch of the obvious cases. And as people use them more and more, uh, we start adding more refined error messages around. But the idea is that we normally coordinate with the core developers, or sometimes it's just us, um, the, or, or people that are excited about those particular subsets, and they say, okay, this is a very good opportunity because there is little error messages here. Um, but there is other, another interesting case, which is that when, when new peps are added, uh, Several features that, for instance, the new pack parser allows this concept of soft keywords, which is a maybe a keyword, maybe not, like match, right? Like you can use match as a variable, as, a, as an argument, but you can also use it as a keyword. This, uh, this, this, this is cool because like we don't need to, you know, forbid everyone using match as a variable name, uh, and it's a cool technology. But like the problem is that this makes the parser extremely more tricky around the soft keyword because it means that the parser needs to 
figure out more about that. Like it needs to reparse that a bunch of times or maybe like infinite bad tracking because it needs to just try everything and then try it without the soft keyword. So adding soft keywords is very tricky and very dangerous. And what I have seen is that there is a lot of people thinking that now it's free party, uh, keywords for everyone. Um, but th that is complicated, right? Because like, e even if it's very exciting because you don't need to add normally the cost of like, now people cannot write this thing as a keyword, then it turns out that you know having a good analysis of the grammar and the impact on error messages is important because adding soft keywords may invalidate a bunch of error messages around the soft keywords. Like you saw it in the match statement, like the comma error, invalidated the match statement, right? So, so it's very tricky to fix and, and take into account those. And the more soft keywords you add, the more tricky it becomes. So one of the things that we are doing in the steering council and in Python Dev in general is to be very, be very careful when you know, people propose new soft keywords because this, this cost needs to be taken into account. Even if it's, I mean, you know, like people are super excited because now they can propose new syntax, but uh, this cost is not free on the parser. And you know, like at the end of the day, what do you want? More you know, grammar or better error messages? So it turns out that this is a decision that you maybe need to do, right? And, and that's what, one of the challenges that we have. But yeah, yeah very good question, Daniel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's give uh, Pablo a warm round of applause and thank him for the talk. <laughs>